was the best thing we ever had in California for entertainment, the California gubernatorial race, the um, debate between Ariane Huffington and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. You remember? The one you needed, like, the UN headset for? Wasn't it the greatest? I'm allowed to understand why you say you're not a and then you have a... You have no idea what to do with the goalie phone. You have I broke my femur. Ah! <laughs> Stephanie, you are a very popular television and radio hostess and personality, comedian, commentator, and professional conversationalist. We really appreciate you having this conversation today. I'd like to start at the beginning. Uh, By the way, that was so spectacular how you read that off that cue card, uh, just the way I wrote it. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. You could punch popular a little more next time. You're right, and I did in the, in the early going, but right. then, uh, the, then I screwed it up later on. Right. Wildly popular? Very popular. It's fine. Wildly would have been better, though. Let me write that in real here, right here on my notes. Um, let's start at the beginning. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was uh, abandoned by wolves and raised by Republicans. I was born in Washington, D.C. Poor wolves. Yes, yes. I was. Uh, they must have really wondered what they had there. I was, <laughs> I was very hairy. I had a unibrow. This is not a lie. Um, no, I was born in uh, Washington, D.C. When I was three, we moved to uh, Lockport, New York, to upstate New York, uh, near Buffalo. Okay. Uh, as I say, it's up the transit from uh, Cheektowaga, Lackawanna, and uh, Tanawanda. <laughs> they're all Indian names for, I'm freezing my boobs off. I have to get the hell out of here. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so you actually came from uh, very famous parents. Well, yeah, my dad uh, ran for vice president with Barry Goldwater in 1964. So, and, and I don't remember it because I was three. I was, again, I was born in Washington. My dad was a congressman for 14 years and chairman of the Republican Party. And I always say that my parents uh, either had the common decency not to use us as campaign props like the Palins did, or I was just too ugly <laughs> to be of any help whatsoever. I remember my friend, a friend of mine, saw the official campaign photo where my dad's holding me in his arms, and she goes, God, if he would have just dubbed in a sack of potatoes, he might have at least carried Idaho. I love the people of the United States of America. 200 million strong, devoted to God, consecrated to liberty, and all Crusaders for justice, all crusaders for equality of opportunity for every person on the face of the earth. And on this point, I want the record unmistakably clear. I vastly admire and respect the courage, the integrity, the selfless commitment to principle of one of the most dynamic and forceful leaders in the nation's history, Senator Barry Goldwater of Indiana. Your father uh, was a very well-respected person. I mean, he yeah. was really well-liked. And even though that campaign was not successful, he came through it very well. Aw, that was so understated how you just mentioned the landslide. That was so cute. One of the biggest landslides in history. Wah, wah. It happens. Yes, but, uh, but thank you for saying that because I think the same thing. He was an assistant prosecutor at Nuremberg. Kind of an amazing man. Yeah, he really was a, a, you know, a good man, a kind man, um, and I think, as I say all the time on the radio, just this is not my dad and Goldwater's Republican Party anymore. Um, I, I think that, I mean, look at Barry spoke out for gay rights on, in That's the right. 80s on the Senate floor. And he had that famous line about, you, about gays in the military, you don't have to be straight, you just have to shoot straight. Um, he has a gay grandson, as you probably know. Um, and I just, I know my dad's heart. And I think I know, you know, to some degree, not obviously the same, but Goldwater's heart and the, the kind of things they stood for. And certainly one of them was the government staying out of people's private lives. So. I can only extrapolate what they'd feel about marriage equality, but I, I, 
I, again, I know sort of where I know where my dad's heart was. Well, conservatism in its right form means you know let people do what they want to do, right? And don't judge them by their sexual preference, their race, right. color, creed. Right. Judge them one at a time. We seem to have gotten far away from that in 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 current the current political dialogue, at least among conservatives. Yeah, I remember my dad, one of his lines in his speeches used to always be that that's the problem with the government. They always have one hand in everybody's pocket and the other hand in everybody's business. And, you know, of course, one was lower, you know, the typical Republican lower taxes thing. But, but again, you know, a lot of times people will say, oh, you know, what's your dad think? Well, my dad's been gone since 83, so it's hard to speak for him. But I, I think, you know, a lot of the same things that you think that uh, I, I think it's not even... Reagan's party anymore. I'm not even sure it's George Bush's party anymore. That's a really interesting point. Yeah. Um, and if you really read what Barry Goldwater wrote and, to us, and the interviews that your father gave, which I remember because I'm about, I'm about 10 years older than you are, and I actually was able to see what was going on at that time, uh, it's it's uh, exemplary. It really is commendable, the approach they were taking. Um, and I think they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. My dad talked about one thing at the dinner table. It was how he really wished that he could have blown up more little girls holding daisies. I mean, it was the first really yeah. dirty ad that was, and they only heard it once. But but you're right. I, I think that I, I remember the, you know, their slogan was, go water in your heart, you know he's right. And they put out ones on the other side that said, in your guts, you know he's nuts. <laughs> and they were, I think, successful in that and sort of, uh, um, but you know, it's interesting how even Vietnam in retrospect, I mean, I think what Barry's point always was is we're doing enough to get our boys killed, we're not doing enough to win. And so I, I think that some, you know, I think some of it was overblown, except that to the degree that my dad had to start every speech in the campaign with, what Barry meant to say was. <laughs> yes, that's. He got into a whole a thing challenge. about, what size tactical nuclear weapon could be carried in a suitcase? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's you know, typical politics. It, it was an uphill battle, and, uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson was an excellent campaigner. He'd been doing it uh, for years and years and years and had his own special approach to it. Well, and I think in the, in the wake of Kennedy's assassination, I always think that there's no way they were going to, the American people were going to elect three different presidents in how many years, right? They weren't going to make that kind of change. What was your mom like? Um, my mom, um, <laughs> typical, you know, Republican hair and pearls and all that. She uh, Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> but um, my mom is, it's interesting. I've had this discussion with a friend the other day about a generational thing. My mom was very smart, top of her class, really wanted to go to college. Her mom wouldn't let her. She said, you know, you have to go to work in the restaurant. Her grandmother owned a restaurant. Sure. And she met my dad when she was very young and married young. But she just, I, I think that she was the typical political wife of that era. And yet, I, in knowing her, you know, and being close to her in later years, I think there was always some frustration. She was a great mom. But I think women in those days didn't think they had a, a, a choice, you know. So, um I, I think that, way, and I'm sure in many ways that was very stressful for her. The role of political wife is always, it's always very stressful. Well, you're very smart. Was she a smart woman as she was? Yeah, no, as I was saying, like top of her class. And I remember she, uh, she and my dad met, she was a witness. And he was a young attorney then and uh, worked for my grandmother on some case. And my mother had to be a witness in the case. And, you know, of course, I remember she said, I'll never forget, dad winked at me when I was on the the stand. <laughs> How saucy. Um, but, uh, she was offended and complimented yeah. at the, all at the same time. But I remember he won the case and he always said, you know, I, I used to tell my clients two things, either you lost your case or I won your case. <laughs> and he said, in this case, I won the case. But I went in person to tell, like, you know, which, which lawyers never do. But of course, he went to see my mother. So Well, um, he, but, he spotted her. Here's the thing where I've been ruined for life on a romantic level. My parents got engaged on the third date, were married for 40 years very happily until my dad passed away. And it, I don't know yes. if that gives you an unrealistic view of marriage or it makes you really believe in marriage. But it's interesting. I remember my mom said, my dad didn't ask her to marry him. He, she, he told her. <laughs> he was very aggressive. Well, um, but she, I guess, accepted that proposal of yes. sorts. Yes. Um, 
My parents have been married for 62 years. Wow. Uh, my dad's 89, my mom's 86. I'm wow. very, very lucky to still have them. And, you know, they, they still treat each other so kindly and wow. so graciously that for me, relating to your comment, it's an inspiration to spend time with them and to yeah. observe them and the way they, they treat each other after so many years. You probably, within your soul, revere greatly well, and really love what they have. Yeah, and interestingly, my, my oldest sister and her husband were engaged on the third date and have been happily married for 40-something years oh, now. interesting, and so really. It, it's interesting how this whole fight for marriage equality that we're in now you yes. know, resonates on a much deeper level for me because I really believe in marriage. Um, that's not to say I'm not currently a giant single loser. My point, <laughs> my point Stephen, is that theoretically, I would love to be married someday. It's the template that I grew up with and that right. I believe in. And I know that, you know, when I've had a chance to talk to Ted Olson, you know, I think, you know, he lost his first wife uh, in the, in 9-11 and she yes. was in the plane that hit the Pentagon. Yes. But, you know, he, he is actually very happy. His current wife is amazing, you know, and she, I had a chance to talk to her at one point and she said, you know, Ted really believes in marriage. He just really believes in it for everybody. And, you know, that, that uh, piece he wrote for Newsweek, the conservative case for gay marriage, was so, so compelling, I thought. It's one of the better things I've seen, uh, written in a very balanced way from somebody who you would not necessarily expect, right. you know, those yeah. observations, really. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, I think it uh, depends on the person. You, uh, uh, some people don't mind being alone. Uh, I'm not one of those people. I, I'm very needy, very clingy. We'll probably end this interview with me wrapped around your head like a koala. Well, I welcome that. Okay, good. Because Do you have any eucalyptus? <laughs> um, in back. We, we raise it out there in the bushes, <laughs> I think. <laughs> what were you like as a child? You mentioned that you were uh, a wiseacre at an early right. age. You, just passed well, I, over I that, that was, quickly. That was, I don't even remember that. I was three. I don't remember saying such a thing, but um, this will shock a lot of people, but kind of a tomboy, which of course is code for Junior Dyke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I because uh, I grew up you know largely with my brother, so I was kind of a tomboy. Sure. Um, and also traumatized because uh, he, uh, w well, I'm just trying to think, he did grow up later to be a, a Republican and I'm not saying this has anything to do with it, but he did hang me once. Not kidding. I've obviously survived it. But yeah, he had uh, attached a noose to the banister upstairs and put a chair there. And the trusting little sister that I was, he was like, Steffi, put, come here and put your neck in this. I was like, okay. And so then he pulled the chair and I just, well, go get mom. It was that, you know, some, I choked out, go get mom. And so he was trying to sort of like hold me up and then he dropped me to go get mom, of course, which... And if there's anything that can be compared to a mother seeing her youngest child uh, hanging by the neck, I've not seen it yet. And all I just remember is her, her yelling, Billy, cut her down! Cut her down! And he did, which was and, nice. And you're here to tell the tale. Yeah. But he also had, uh, with a lot of foresight, had dug a grave for me in the fruit cellar. It was a, you know, a dirt place in the cellar where we had apples and you know, onions and potatoes. And so my mom uh, went down to get potatoes or something for dinner and it had rained and so my mom fell in the hole that was uh, intended for me and that that was also you could hear that throughout the whole house Billy and well this is fairly typical childhood behavior right oh yes very typical if you're the Adams family <laughs> most 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 kids try to hang their siblings at least once yeah. or twice he used to shoot me with his BB gun but he in fairness he did always give me a running head start he would always look at me and say Steffi run and then I would just hear the pump action on his, you know. Right. And so I would know how fast I had to run to, you know. Well, I think that taught you a lot about how to live life. Right. Keep, keep right. running. And My point is this is what made me gay, clearly. <laughs> I, I assumed all men were like that. And uh, no, I was very, I, you know, just loved sports and, and uh, okay. was very uh, uh, athletic, as, um, you know, junior dykes are. I remember my, <laughs> my friend... We, I'm writing a book, and so we had my mom ship a bunch of boxes of my stuff, and one entire huge box is full of trophies, all kinds of softball and basketball and whatever. And my friend just goes, what are the chances you weren't going to be gay? <laughs> it was a little sports box. 
I, I understand. My, my daughter is gay, and she's a beautiful 26-year-old. And she was always extraordinary in sports. I mean, I, I played a lot of sports in high school and in college, right. but always had to work really hard at it. She was a natural. She, yeah. could, she could do everything I could not yeah, do. Yeah, that's a tip-off. Gays are good at everything. <laughs> well, there you go. Tip-off right away. And she really enjoyed boys who had cars, particularly cars she could take apart. <laughs> so... Okay, any girl that knows what a master cylinder is, just saying. Well, it was, it was very funny, and, but I never saw it. I it never registered with right. me, and it was years after, I will tell you, I didn't have a clue with my yeah. daughter. It my never, family didn't either. It, did, it never registered with me until um, she told David and told him not to tell anybody, and he, David, of course, immediately told yeah. Paul. Yeah, very true. And Paul right. immediately told me, which I appreciated because then when my daughter, Boo, whose given name is Meredith, but everybody calls her Boo, came in to uh, talk about it, I was, I was prepared so I didn't fall out of my chair or anything. When, when she learned her very came. first lesson, don't ever count on the gay guy not to gossip because... Well, she knew exactly what she They're was born doing. that way. They can't help it. Yep. But, you know, it was ironic because, you know, what greater gift can you give to a daughter than a company like that, that she can be part of and work in and have a cause and, you know, that really contributes to people's lives every day. You know, Steve, and, I, I... And I didn't even know. Yeah, I no, I was, um, I always say that I was so busy worrying that my family was going to judge me. You know, they're Republican, they're Catholic, they're... Sure. That I spent 15 years really judging them and I was wrong. And I lost 15 years of closeness with them by, you know, editing the pronouns and where I'm spending the holidays and all of that. So I, because it took me 15 years before I told them and they couldn't all have been better about it and just said, why didn't you tell us? I mean, but I think you're right. It's at a certain point, if you don't, maybe number one, fit a stereotype necessarily. I think that, you know, and I was just ambitious enough and career-oriented enough and had not just enough boyfriends when I was younger that they really didn't know. And I was sort of shocked they were shocked, but they, they really didn't know. And my mom's so cute. She, <laughs> I was crying. And so I just remember that moment. She burst into tears, too, and just hugged me. She's like, oh, Steffi, you know. Like, she just, I think she just thought I was lonely all those years. I think she just thought, oh, well, only Steffi only cares about her career and, you know. The poor girl. Yeah, yeah, she just thought I was a loser, which she was right about that part to some degree. But, um, but yeah, I, I mean, it really was, it has been, it, I think that's when we all get to that certain point, tipping point with our families, right, where we say, I just don't, I'm too old to do this, to edit pronouns and have to hide and have to, uh, but, um, yeah, no, so it was, and I understand, like, not everybody is that, lucky, but uh, I, I think, like I say, certainly we've come so far so fast. I mean, I think that a lot of times, a lot of, a lot of us, it wasn't that I, I was out to my friends and family for a long time before I was out publicly, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of us, and initially you feel like, I'm just really private. I'm a private person. I don't, I don't, I never lied. I never went into a fake marriage or made up boyfriends or sure. said I was straight. I just didn't talk about it as much, but I think that the fact that so many other women gave me the courage to do that, and then we stand on all their shoulders, and you know, hopefully it's a domino effect to, to, to women like your daughter, because it, it, the more and more comfortable you become being able to talk about it, and not being afraid and not hiding, the more you empower someone else to do it. My, it you know, in my case, I'm, no, I'm sure you guys know Shelley Wright very well, the country singer, and yes. She was, I, we always call her my gay whisperer because she came out right before I did and we became very good friends. And basically she shot down all my arguments because she had all the same ones. I mean, she's same thing. She's a beautiful country singer. She was marketed as they market singers, you know. Right. Um, and she, she made a lot of really salient points that she just said it's more incumbent on those of us that can hide not to because it, it makes a difference to that kid in Kansas that, oh, it's my favorite country singer or my favorite radio host or my favorite, you know, and she said it makes a difference to that kid in Kansas that's about to kill herself because she thinks she's never going to have a happy life or, or a career or anything. And, and so it makes a difference to say, not just I'm for that, but I am that. Yes. You know, to stop cheering gay rights from the sidelines and get down on the field yourself. And I think, for me, I hit my perfect tipping point with that. With We were in the midst of the talk then about overturning Don't Ask, Don't Tell and marriage equality. And I just thought, 
I can't talk authentically about these issues anymore without talking about myself. So that was part of, you know, part of my, but I always say she kicked me out of the closet with her cowboy boot. She just, get out. Stephanie, as you grew up, where'd you go to school? And where'd you study? I would, uh, 16 years hard time in Catholic school. <clears throat> I'm an ex-Catholic girl gone wild. How was that? How was Catholic school? How did you find it? It was awful. No, it was, <laughs> it was, it's all I knew. It was fine. I went um, to Catholic school too, did you? so yes. Did you? Yeah, I always say it was, I'm a, I was a practicing Catholic and then I got so good at it that I went professional, so I don't uh, practice anymore. Um, you know, I think it teaches you certain values that are good. It's just that I don't, I think a lot of the laws are church laws. They're not God's laws. I mean, I still don't know what layer of purgatory I'm in for eating meat on Fridays in the 70s. I'm not really sure the level of sin. Yes, it seems a little arbitrary, doesn't yes. it? Yes. And I think that it is interesting in this fight for marriage equality how many people quote the Bible, and they're the same people that quote the Bible, if you watch the movie Lincoln, about slavery, about interracial you know, inter, uh, marriage. Um, and I just, I've certainly talked to enough theologians that say, you know, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality, and Sodom and Gomorrah was about promiscuity. It wasn't about homosexuality, and so I think, you know, you can go round and round on that stuff. Once you escaped from Catholic school, yes. you made your way into college at that yes. point? Yes. Okay. And I went to uh, USC out here in California, yes. University of Spoiled Children. And what did you study? I studied theater. Why, thank you for asking. I have a degree in drama, okay. which qualifies me to work in any 7-Eleven in this country. <laughs> It's very, very valuable. What did, what did you do while you were in theater? What did you, did you, were you in plays? Did you? Yes. Okay. I played uh, the nurse in Streetcar Named Desire in the Edinburgh Theater Festival. And I would be happy to reenact my line for you now. Why don't we do that at another interview when we have a little more Take time. a second. Listen, don't harsh my buzz. <laughs> Blanche, it's time to go. See, I think you. I think you see what could have been in terms of a career. It's really a tragedy. I also was the only person that could not dance in the entire uh, company. And so they put me in the chorus in West Side Story until the um, choreographer was literally picking my legs up, legs up physically and saying, no, like this. And then he just said, you're on spotlight. So I had to run the spotlight. Well, it sounds like your career was going very well at that point. Yeah. Um, once you got done with school, what'd you do then? Uh, I sold uh, pens on the phone as you do when you have a theater degree. Um, and then um, my dad actually died right after I graduated from college. Ugh, it was very um, sudden. I remember they came out for graduation and he just, you know, they said, oh, daddy has to go in for a test. And I wasn't really that alarmed. He was 69. Um, anyway, the, the angiogram, they hit a clot going in and it sprayed clots all over his body. It caused a stroke and it caused, you know, several strokes and he went into a coma and died. And, within two weeks, so it was, uh, yeah, I mean, a very uh, tough time, you know. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I went back to be with my mom and then I just started um, doing stand-up in the clubs and that's where I sort of fell into radio by accident. <clears throat> I, uh, I started doing voices on a friend's comedy show in Buffalo. I did horrible things like, you know, Catherine Hepburn and the traffic copter and, it's a little choppy on the Skajackwood Expressway, Sam, hey. I would do Linda Blair with the weather. It's hot as hell. It was really spectacular stuff, Stephen. I'm sorry you missed it. Well, it sounds like a very good start. Yes. And so you did local radio? I did. And the first job, they didn't pay me. They promised me a bike. Uh, but I never got that. You never got the bike? No. How does one make one's way from local radio to something else? What's the well, process? Then? I always said that it was a total accident at first radio and then they started paying me a lot of money and then it was not an accident anymore. Um, I, it really was just, I think by circumstance that I was back there and you know, I thought I was gonna be Carol Burnett and then that dream died. Um, and radio is really where dreams go to die. Stephen, that's where you end up. I actually finally met Carol Burnett this year um, and I'd been waiting my whole life, and so I, I said what you would expect. I said, Fleh. that was kind of all that, there was some sort of sound that came out. When I finally got a chance to meet her, I said, I wanted to be you, but it didn't work out. But uh, yeah, I, uh, that's, you know, like, again, it's like, what's the saying? Life is what happens when you're making other plans. So I just started, um, 
I got my first real radio job in Rochester. I was uh, Sister Slees on the Brother Wee's Morning Circus. Um, I still years now, I mean, even today, people will see me on the street and yell Slees, which is, <laughs> you can imagine. <laughs> my sister was in a, some tropical location as people ran into her and they were like, oh my God, your sister Slees is sister? It's quite a family's very proud, as you can imagine. They talk about it all the time. And yes. I remember I broadcast uh, naked in a barrel uh, from a department store window there, but who can remember why? It was some sort of wacky 80s radio it's DJ stunt. So you were doing that, and then how did you move up towards larger markets? I, how, did uh, that, how did that happen? Got a job in Chicago, doing uh, morning drive radio in Chicago. You must have been pretty good, despite the fact you were doing you know, small market stuff because you worked your way up and that's not easy. Yeah, I, I um, well, I was either lucky or it was that Catherine Hepburn and the, the traffic chapter that was just a little unparalleled. Um, yeah, and then I got a morning drive show in uh, New York on a uh, hot 97, everybody. Boys to Men tickets coming right up. Uh, and uh, did that for, I guess, three years and then I got actually my first sitcom deal with uh, Warner Brothers out here in LA. And so I was like, ba-bing, quit my radio show, moved out here, and then everybody at Warner Brothers got fired. Wah, wah, part two. Well, that's what happens uh, quite often. <laughs> yes. You make plans and then yes. everybody's gone by the yes. time you get there. It happens with movies all the time. I know. You have something going on and then all of a sudden, you know, no one you were dealing with is, is still there. Yeah. So yeah. what did you do then? Then I started doing talk radio for the first time out here on KFI. Um, and it was interesting because I'd always done just morning radio where they're, they're like, be funny in 10 seconds between the songs. And this was, and I, and I always had a partner, you know, a, a co-host. And so sure. this is the first time I was by myself. And the first segment is like 12 minutes. So I was like, blah, 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 blah. Oh, me again? Blah, 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 blah. Really? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> How do you do that? Yeah, but I had to, you know, so I, that's when I first started talking about issues and politics and stuff because I'd never done talk radio before. And I'd only done weekends for, I think, a month or two when I got a deal at Disney for a late night TV show, which I was like, this is what happens to everyone when they come to town after two months. Um, and that was, as many things in my life, a uh, disaster. Lasted 13 weeks. Um, <laughs> It was, I was too dumb. I was like, they were like, would you like to go up against Leno and Letterman? I'm like, yes. Sure, that makes what sense. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, I remember the, uh, when you looked at the listings, I, I knew I was in trouble when you'd see like Leno had Jim Carrey and Letterman had Mel Gibson and I had like Binky the balloon blower woman or something. I don't, I remember Hog Caller from Iowa. We got really big, 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 big bookings. Boy, it's hard to compete, isn't it? At yes. that level. Yes. Yeah. So I'll never forget. And so, your first lesson in television about how many executives are actually involved. <laughs> because uh, it was just a lot of like, oh, we love what you do on the radio, that's spontaneous, don't do any of that now. Just read the cue cards and don't. <laughs> I mean, it was just so overproduced, I think. Uh, and well, and they took your strength and yeah. didn't want you to use yeah. it at all. They wanted My you to do something else. Yeah. My favorite story, it was Halloween, so people were dressed up in the audience and there were people, uh, dressed up as Amish people in the front row and I made it just a quick quip about your buggies double park by the way and literally they you know on live TV they never it was live to tape so you didn't have very long to hit before you hit satellites so I remember they Stephanie we're uh, stopping down there's a technical problem and so then all these producers like and executives descend on the stage and they said we're gonna do that again we're afraid we're gonna offend the Amish who are a big part of our and audience like, <laughs> they don't have televisions or electricity. And then, uh, <laughs> I'll never forget, Kinky Friedman was my first guest. And I just, one of the first questions, I said, how'd you get that name, Kinky? And he goes, well, it used to be Kinky Big Dick Friedman. <laughs> but I had to change it. Did they stop? No, they didn't stop filming. And then literally, you know you're in trouble when the camera guy gets a bigger laugh than you do. We want to go to break and everybody's on headset. And he goes, I wonder if Big Dick will offend the Amish. <laughs> television ladies and gentlemen. That must have been very disappointing for you to have that happen <laughs> at that point. So you came to the end of 13 weeks. 
which actually is a pretty long run against yes. the, that kind of competition. Right. And you may, in retrospect, you may say, "Well, I was only on for 13 weeks." You can say, "I was on for 13 weeks." I was on for 13 weeks. What happened then? Oh, you know the usual uh, ignominy that comes after. I remember. Then I started auditioning to play the fourth. You know banana on whatever sitcom I just started and I'll never forget my stage was at Paramount it was um, I, I can't I think it's Dr. Phil's stage now somebody but at Paramount so that was my stage in my office building there and so that's literally where I had to go back for my first audition my cattle call with all the other actors and our <laughs> sides oh and they're doing they're doing the tours you know in the cart and a bunch of people recognized and were like oh my god that's Stephanie Miller from the Stephanie Miller show and I'm just like keep moving you bastards <laughs> What are you looking at? <laughs> so, did you audition successfully for anything no, at that point? No, not for, not for anything. How frustrating. They apparently did not see my work as Blanche in A Streetcar Named Desire. Well, and, and I stepped on your line, so I, I feel awful. Well, you, you, as you should. Your bad luck is continuing. Right. You, you hear Thanks years later. And I didn't even know <laughs> what, what I was doing. So eventually, you must have gotten employed doing something. I must have, or I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you, right? Well, or you'd be working in a very different line of work, I think, doing something different. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, I, you know, it's like a lot of people in this business, you know, you just keep perseverance. You just keep uh, trying. So I guess Is that, that the key? Yeah, that's it. You just keep coming back. That's how I've achieved this level of mediocrity, and I like I'm just I'm staying right here because uh, otherwise it just gets too exhausting. Um, but yeah, then I started doing talk radio again. I did a late. Uh, uh, I think you have a high level of mediocrity. I oh, think. thank you. That's so sweet. You're welcome. Thanks. Please continue though. Thanks. <laughs> um, and tell us how how you paid your rent for the next period of time. Oh, yeah, God, it's exhausting. Who can remember? Went back into radio. Into I'm sorry to make you do this. No, it's this all right. Is, this is really interesting. Oh, it's like flashbacks. Um, when it went to K, uh, ABC Radio Network, did an evening radio show. Uh, at the same time, I co-hosted Equal Time with Babe Buchanan <laughs> on CNBC. And I remember my producer used to say it was like the comedy and tragedy masks in the boxes when we came up at the beginning, because they was not fond of me. She used to start every sentence with, once again, Stephanie, you have your facts wrong. Let me explain it to you. That was so pleasant. I loved it. So that was a pretty disagreeable experience. We were on opposite coasts because I think we would have killed each other if we were in the same room. It was hilarious. It was, no, the ratings were great. I think it was sort of like watching a traffic accident. It was, right. you know, I was doing Tonight Show and she was doing Crossfire. It was a little bit of a, you know, disconnect. And was it largely political? Yeah. That point? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I, in a series of disastrous career decisions, I left to do some clip show, Show Me the Funny, uh, which uh, I, I don't, on some network that I, who can even recall now. But it was, uh, yeah, somebody said, I've ho I think I've hosted every single kind of show there, there is. A late night show, a game show, a clip show, a morning show, a, you know, so. Well, you've, you've done, uh, uh, I've got a secret. That was the game show, right? Yes. So that's a legendary show, and yeah. you recreated it. Yeah. How was that experience? That was actually, I would have to say, I think the most fun I've ever had in television. It was that was awesome. That was a really fun show. Um, I had Terry Garr and uh, Jim J. Bullock uh, and Amy Yazbek on my panel, and uh, you know, you had a fun group. Yeah, the contestant would have a secret, and they had to guess what the secret was. It really, it's it's a comedy show. It's really a comedy show disguised as a game show, I guess. Um, I got to do really classy things like I, the secret was um, I just had my butt bronzed by this woman. And it, she was a sculptor and it, she, you know, did bronzes of body parts. And so uh, at the end of the show, we unveiled, unveiled my uh, bronze ass. So you had a lot of very sophisticated material you were dealing right. with at that point. Right. And that was actually the second time I had it done. I auctioned one off uh, for charity. Uh, at the radio show, I bought the first uh, bronze of my butt is in some guy's basement in L.A. Some guy has a piece of my ass in his uh, basement. <laughs> well, uh, and I auctioned my. Uh, it's a work of art. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, you did some work for Oxygen. Yeah, well, uh, I've got a secret was for Oxygen, and then also I hosted uh, Pure Oxygen, which was their sort of Today Show meets, yes. meets the View. So. And how was that experience? It was great. That was great. Although. Um, 
<laughs> that was one of those things where I lived in LA and there were, it was in New York and I said, okay, this is gonna get canceled though, right? Because I sold my house, moved there, bought a house and they're like, no, 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 no. As long as the network's here, this show is going to be here. It's the anchor show of this network. Cut to, ready? Say it with me, everybody. Wah, wah. <laughs> the network, you know, was tough. It got in trouble like a lot of startups do and um, a lot of stuff got canceled and they eventually got sold, but uh, yeah. A lot of these networks are struggling right yeah. now, and, and, and they are struggling. Well, I killed it. I killed it. It's the, it's the first uh, uh, network of Oprah's uh, that I've killed. And if she lets me on own, I, I'm going to kill that one, too. I don't think you really killed it. I think they, they, they did more to themselves or caused themselves more problems. I think you were a teeny tiny part of their, of their story. What was Balderdash? What what was that show oh, that you uh, were on? I didn't host that show, did I? No, I was just on that show. You Elaine Boozler uh, hosted that show. Yes. Who was fabulous. And uh, yeah, I just was on it a lot. That was a really fun, same kind of thing. It was yeah. really a comedy show disguised as a game show, but that was fun. You must have had a fun interaction with her because she's yeah. as as quick and as clever as you are. I love her. I love her. I've known her for years and years. Well, she's she's very good. I, uh, I was one of those pesky, like, you know, young comedians that came up to her at the ice house. I love you so much, I wanna be here. You know, that kind of thing. I see. Yeah. You notice when I'm talking to my comedy idols, my front teeth get really far out. I love you so much. I don't know what happens. That, that's a very unusual effect. I don't, I don't think I could duplicate that if I tried. <laughs> you have better teeth than I do. Thank too. you. Um, They're fake. What, uh, so are my daughters, but. <laughs> Don Imus was fired. Yes. You came in and filled in afterwards. Yes. Yeah, well, I was pre-fired from that one. I knew I would be fired after three days, so that was good knowing in advance. You, you knew that you would be fired? Yes. Well, I, they were just, they had a bunch of different people fill in. And yes. I knew at the time that they were going to, the, the guy in charge had told me they're going to go with someone in-house that's under contract, and which they did, Joe, Joe Scarborough. Yes. And I think they also weren't going to do another radio show after I missed because it was just too risky. That's why he got fired, because yep. you're bound to say something dumb when you talk for three hours a day. So you just stepped in on a temporary basis to yeah. Uh, yeah. deal with that? Yeah, and they, uh, they refer to it now as the sweating incident. I had a, uh, you know, kind of an epic Robert Hayes in airplane kind of, and but oddly no one really told me there was just like pit stains because you, you know, the TV lights are fine for a quick interview, but for three hours, <laughs> You begin to melt yes. at some point. Yes. Were you the Stephanie Miller show at that point? Was there a Stephanie Miller show, or did that come after those various steps? Oh, there's been so many Stephanie Miller shows. It's, uh, it's hard to say. Yeah, when I run into somebody, they'll go, oh, I was on your show. I'm like, you'll have to be more specific. <laughs> I mean, because every, every, all of these radio shows or whatever were some version of that, you know. Okay. So that had been what the show had been called in various incarnations right. Right. along the way. Right. There's a sort of, a, you go into the uh, federal talk show host relocation program for a short time and then everyone forgets and they go, hey, you know what would be a good idea? The Stephanie Miller Show. And I'm like, yes. Of course. And you're probably one of the few people who can actually do the Stephanie Miller Show. Yes. Being Stephanie Miller. Yeah. Yeah. Very helpful. Suck on that. For that, for that right. kind of. Eat my gravel soup, bitches. <laughs> what did I mean by that? I don't know. I'm sleepy because I do morning radio. Am I making any sense at all? Earlier you did. Okay. We, well. We've lost that portion of, okay. the, of the show, though, <laughs> um, which is what we're supposed to be having here. <laughs> right, right. Conversations with. Now, the, the current incarnation of the Stephanie Miller show, how would you describe that show? Is it a... a comedy show? Is it a political show? Is it both? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I've always thought of what I do is a comedy show. I mean, I think that if you make people laugh, they don't really know they're learning something. I think anybody that gets on a soapbox on either side yep. and is just doing talking points, it's just not entertaining. We try to make fun of everybody. Um, I certainly come from a very specific political bent, but uh, that being said, we just try to make it a comedy show and we don't talk just about politics we talk about pop culture entertainment yep. stupid things on the internet that I frequently get obsessed with like goats that scream like humans stuff like that now you have your mooks yes who are the mooks uh, they are Chris Lavoie and Jim Ward and they've been with me for years we did the old they've been my friends for years we did the old uh, ABC radio show at night uh, um, 
So yeah, we um, Jim used to pre-record bits. He and Carlos Els Rocky were my voice guys, and they pre-recorded bits for the show. They weren't there with me live, but when I started this new show, you know, um, nine years ago or so um, in Progressive Radio, I decided to have that, you know, have him in studio. Chris had been my my engineer, my board op, uh, and I made him executive producer and Jim co-host, and that's what we've been doing. And you guys go back and forth, and uh, yeah come up with all sorts of different ideas and things to talk yeah. about. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you know, when they talk about chemistry, it's hard to replicate when you've really been friends and working together for so yes. many years. A lot of times they try to throw you together with someone, and chemistry's chemistry, I think, in any walk of life, any kind of relationship. Well, and I'm astounded by what you do. I mean, uh, carrying on a conversation back and forth for three hours. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of the best stuff in radio happens, obviously, improvisationally, and that's why I love it. I just think it's the freest form of... Uh, expression for me anyway because I as I joked earlier about some of the stories of TV but TV can be very just overproduced and superficial and that's why it all looks the same rather than radio you can't possibly produce three hours you can't write it I mean there's callers there's spontaneous conversation there's guests I mean it's, it's not scripted it can't be by its nature well you do an extraordinary job with that that's Thank you. that is tough stuff Stephanie most recently um, you've been on current TV and they've done a simulcast, so you've been on both radio and TV at the same time. How has that worked? Well, it's worked great. We're, I, I think, the, almost the top-rated show on Current, maybe the second. I'm endlessly fascinated at how fascinated people are watching radio, but I think they love the behind-the-scenes thing. It's more like a reality show. They're, it's yep. just a fly-on-the-wall kind of thing. We're not... Um, trying to pretend we're doing the Today Show. I mean, we're just doing the radio show. I'm in my baseball cap. I'm in, on my way to spinning class. Um, and that's what they wanted. They just wanted the... Um, I think our show is probably a lot more f physical and, and visually interesting. Yes, I think because, that's right. you know, I have a guy that does impressions, and we're all very sort of physical and expressive. And, and I think, um, you know, you're able to see me throwing things at my producer when he doesn't get the right sound effect. And it's it's been a lot of fun. Um, Good. Yeah. Have you uh, found that it changed how you do things differently from just being on radio? Do you behave any differently? Not really. For instance, this morning I was eating leftover pizza and I got a black olive on my front tooth and did not realize it until my producer pointed it out. And I was like, these damn cameras in my day, you just did radio. <laughs> right. You not have to worry about this. I know that uh, you've had uh, uh, pups that you've taken care of for years and years and years. and. Uh, you've uh, had some deaths in the family. Yeah. That must have been very hard. Yeah, I've, I mean, it's so funny how people say, uh, oh, they're like your children. And when you don't have regular children, I'm like, no, they're not like my children. They are my children. Yes. I, uh, I got a dog for every year. I didn't have a child, and now I'm that crazy old dog lady. But uh, you're trying to make me do the voice, aren't you? Because Max and Fred are so handsome and romantic. Wow. Okay, I apologize. I can't help myself. But that is a great voice. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I really do agree with you that, uh, you know, it, they are children. They, yeah. they, well, you get I'm so lost. used to them. Four dogs is probably in the last five years or so, and the show that people remember, and it, it's terrible to think like, oh, I'm turning my pain into entertainment, but, you know, the show must go on. I remember, I, I mean, I had to take a day off when he died because it was very... And sudden, my St. Bernard Chester died of yes. a heart thing, just very suddenly. He just turned five. And uh, so the first day I came back, I was like, well, I have to work. And I literally made it four seconds into the show and just started bawling, you know. And it, you know, it was three hours of a lot of crying, a lot of other people calling and sharing their stories. And, you know, it, um, but it was one of those things where you think, I'm a professional broadcaster, yet I can't really talk about this without... And so, you know, I know a lot of people said, oh, my God, that was like people saved that show, I think, for years. They're like, I, I had to. Well, but people understood it. It was poignant. And, um, you know, people feel the same thing themselves, whether it be about a, a child, a, a sibling, or a pet. Loss. Pet, yeah. really. Loss, it's, right? it's, a, it's a loss of something that's very important to you. And, and, and you know, dogs and cats and other animals, I mean, they become, they become part of us. I have, a, I have a sign in my house that says, I want to be the person my dog thinks I am. But I've always thought there's a reason that dog is God spells backwards. You know, there, there's so many sayings out there that God put dogs on earth to teach people how to love. Well, there's this... Uh, 
great uh, joke about the difference between dogs and cats. That uh, actually there are two of them. One is that, uh, which I'm sure you you may well have heard, which have you know dogs have masters and cats have staff. <laughs> And uh, the other one is that, you know, the dogs, uh, every, they're happy about everything. They're happy to be fed. They're, ha they're happy to be petted. They're happy to watch TV with their master. Yeah. Now it's time to go for a walk. My favorite thing, my favorite thing. And then you contrast it with the cat. And the cat says, day 957 of my captivity. <laughs> I'm being fed this food, which is inedible, but I must keep my strength up and look for my opportunities to escape. <laughs> and it's the difference between cats and and dogs. But, um, you yeah. know, you've made a part of your show, your personal life. You talk about all kinds of personal things and uh, you do it so naturally that, you know, the dogs were, you know, really, really important. So that, I think, was a natural segue into yeah. your, uh, into your yeah. show. Funny you should bring that up. My last relationship ended because, uh, A, she had two cats and I'm deathly allergic, as we found out. And two, she was a no dogs in the bed person. That's a deal breaker. <laughs> It makes sense. <laughs> By the way, on this on this cat joke about her about the cat's captivity, he says, "I have been uh, put in my room, and it has something to do with allergies. I must learn more about this because I can use it to my advantage." <laughs> I just think, you know, you really are. It's like an old eighties. We're in a, we've fallen into an old eighties comedy routine. But uh, dog people and cat people, they really they are. They're just different. Dogs are. Don't you wish we could be as endlessly excited? As dogs, like all just, oh, squirrel, no, biscuit, nap, just everything's. I try to be that way, but I can't get that excited about things. <laughs> but uh, Actually, that's the, one of the best compliments I've gotten. One of my friends said, you're like a puppy. You get so excited about people. And I'm like, I, I do. Now, you've done the uh, Stephanie Miller Sexy Liberal Comedy Tour. Yes. What, what has that been, and how, what has that been like? It's been, once again, a total accident in my life. Uh, I um, really started by accident. We, um, my friends uh, John Fugelsang and Hal Sparks, who are uh, on the show, are regulars on my show, and fabulous comedians, and a little easy on the eyes. It was something we did, an experimental one in New York, and then I think when there were all the worker protests in Madison, somebody just said on the air, you guys ought to go do a sexy liberal tour. We said it on the air, it was sold out within by the end of the day. So. <laughs> It just like, was one of those things that just sort of took off. Um, and it started as a joke, like we just called it that. Like we weren't referring to us, we were referring to the audience. We just said we think it's sexy to be liberal. It means you're empathetic, you're open-minded, you're, uh, you know, if you read the old John F. Kennedy quote about what it means to be a liberal. Um, but it's become this amazing experience. We all, and the, it, it, it changes because I do new stuff depending on what's in the news. Um, we I try to localize to where we're going once in a while. We, we give money to a different sexy liberal cause and we've given to uh, marriage equality, to Trevor Project, to uh, sure. anti-fracking, to you know, workers' rights, to you, know, you name it. But, it. but it's amazing. So we all do uh, stand up and then we do uh, Q&A. Uh, I do Q&A with the audience. We, I do, uh, we do panel where we all talk about the topics of the week or whatever. I knew a lot of times we have um, celebrity guests. But yeah, it, it's been incredible. We've sold out every show across the country. We're, it's just taken on a life of its own, and people have been to several of them. They, they're like Steph heads. They go to five and six of them. So it's been, it's been an incredible ride. Are you continuing to do that? Oh. Yeah, although we've cut back. I mean, we were doing, uh, on top of morning radio show, it was a pretty crazy schedule. We were right. doing like double shows Friday and Saturday night, you know, two or three weekends a month on top of me getting up at four in the morning and doing a morning drive radio show. And it literally was killing me. I mean, I literally was like, I can't. I it's can't. too hard. Yeah. And we've done it for a couple of years. So this year, since it's a post-election year, we're only doing three. We already did a... Uh, East Coast one in DC for the inauguration. We're doing Chicago, and then we're doing a West Coast one in the fall. So it's more of a special event thing. Good. You've you've talked a little bit uh, about your process of coming out, and what do you think about what's happening right now in the last two to three years? I, you know, gay is in the news <clears throat> all the time, which is something you did not see ten years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And of course. It has been a big gay news cycle. It really has. Yes. Yeah. I did not expect to see two Supreme Court cases yeah. dealing with some of these issues, no matter how they're decided. Just the fact yeah. that they are. That well, they I, are I, I said that that was part of, you know, not just my personal path, but politically. You know, I just felt like we were at the tipping point in the civil rights battle 
of my generation, and that was why, for me, it was imperative to come out. And I think that uh, that's what has generated this moving so quickly, as we talked about before. It's that people know somebody, and people's Americans' basic sense of equality and fairness. I think. Ha I mean, nobody has ever seen the kind of polling have seen this flip like this at this pace. And yes. so I hope the Supreme Court does the right thing and makes the bold decision because I think otherwise, if they strike down DOMA and they, they rule narrowly in California, meaning only making marriage legal in California, it's gonna create a patchwork of legal chaos uh, across the country where you can be married you know, here in California, but what if you move to a state that doesn't have, I mean, it just, it creates a basic inequality that, that just should not exist in America. And it's not going to. I mean, it, it is going to happen. It's inevitable. It's just how and, and when it, it happens. Well, I, I've been amazed at the speed of the last three, or three to five years. I would not have thought yeah. that I would see it that quickly. Yeah, I mean, don't ask, don't tell, DOMA, marriage equality. I mean, it really has been incredible. I mean, one of the you know great things at the inauguration, I got to hang out with uh, Senator Tammy Baldwin of uh, Wisconsin. One of the things right. I loved about that is her sexuality, her being gay was not an issue in her campaign at all. And I think that's, that's the right. big deal, is when it's not a big deal anymore. Well, one of the things we've done at Hear TV on the, the, a lot of the shows we've done is that although we do gay programming, uh, gay is sometimes irrelevant yeah. or a byproduct of the show. Well, yeah, ironically, Steve, you know, we talked about that, about my coming out, as I was so afraid to be defined that way. And I thought the funny thing is things have happened so fa fast that I don't think I or anybody else is defined that way anymore. You know, you're always afraid of that old lesbian talk show host rather than just, you know, the great comedian or talk show host or whatever right. you, you want to be thought of as. Um, but I think it, it really is becoming just less and less of a factor, uh, whether it's in politics or a lot of these areas. Well, young people in particular, you know, res don't They don't have, know what the big deal is at all. They don't have the labels. It, it tends to be, you know, what are you talking about? I mean, yeah. do you... You're, you're in, you, you fall in love with who you fall in love with. There was an exchange on my uh, radio show where, you know, a sort of right-wing guy called in. This is a few years ago, actually, and he's like, I don't, I just, I don't know what to, I, what am I supposed to tell my children about gays? I don't understand what it's, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> it was so funny, and another person called in, he goes, yeah, well, we have two lesbians that live next door, and I was, you know, nervous, and then I told my kids, I'm like, you know, Molly and Sarah next door, and blah, 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 told the kids, and the kids were like, Okay, can we keep watching cartoons? <laughs> well, that is the reaction. It's very matter of fact. And right. uh, it means that people are just treating things very matter of factly. And I, I think you will find and are finding that, you know, people kind of don't care one, yeah. one way or the other. Yeah. And the people who do care, you can't do anything about. Yeah. Really. It just is. It just is. One of my happiest days was listening to, hear, to hearing Rush Limbaugh say on the radio, this issue is lost, my friends. We, we have lost. He didn't sound happy about it, which I loved, but he admitted they lost. Despite the difficulties that, you know, all of us are going to face in this, uh, in this fight, it's, it's a good time to be doing this. It's, this is a civil rights issue whose time has come. Yeah. No, it's a, I've always, I say that on the radio, it's an exciting time to be us. It's an exciting yes. time to be uh, an American, I think, because this really, uh, you know, what they did out here in California, the kind of fear-mongering and dividing among, yes. you know, whether it's, you know, Mormons or blacks and gays or what. I mean, it's not working anymore. It's not working anymore. Well, and a parent can give a child a great gift by just giving them a sense of, you know, you judge people one at a time. You don't judge them by, you know, uh, what they believe in, or who they marry, or, or how they conduct, uh, you know, their personal life—it's yeah. irrelevant. And also, you know, you know, I I find that when I'm dealing with executives in our company, whether they're a male or a female, is irrelevant. It doesn't register right. with me in, in my dealing with them. I, I treat them no differently, right. uh, other than you try to treat everyone with a certain amount. Of, right. of courtesy and curiosity. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting. It's just sometimes it is in all those quiet moments that the most progress is made. It's just in every people's decision at every moment of the way. I mean, I remember, you know, I like to do bike trips a lot on vacation because I'm very active. And 
Um, you know, it's interesting. We talked about, you know, just stereotypes and when you maybe don't fit a stereotype of what some people think. I've been on a million different trips where you just with folks that you don't really know and um, the presumption is always that I'm straight. And so we were sitting around with a bunch of the gals, you know, at lunch and, and she was like, oh my God, I know a great guy for you. And you know, normally when I didn't know people and I don't know their comfort level or all their politics, their religion, I would just say, oh, you know, thanks and do you no, know, you know, and then he gives, they give some poor guy your number, <laughs> you know. And just in that moment, I remember making the decision, I just said, I'm gay. and. But I thought the progress in that moment was not me. It was that she didn't skip a beat. She said, oh, well, I have a great girl for you. <laughs> and then there was a look at relief that I was not trying to steal their husband. So it was, <laughs> it was a real moment of solidarity. Yeah, well, she seemed very relaxed at that point. Yeah, I was like, yeah. <laughs> um, there's, there's an advantage to it. Um, the been... feeling, the, the, I mean, I, I, I still think the thing that always strikes me is the funniest is that the guys, God bless them, they just do not buy the whole gay thing. They just, they, you say gay and they hear three-way. Um, many of them really feel that I just have not seen their penis yet. But if I had, it, I would have like, a, oh, I could have had a V8 moment. I would have been like, oh, if I'd seen that. I don't think that's the way it works, actually. <laughs> I, I, I think. Um, they're, they're plucky. They're persistent, the boys. Well, they're. Optimistic and hopeful. Yes, I think. Yes, and it, but it's always that I don't know what that is with that guy fantasy. It's the three-way. It's the I'm like I am not the lesbian porn droid you are looking for. Move along. Because I'm like, by the way, guys, that's most lesbians I know. That's their dream come true too. Is a sweaty guy in the corner, you know, while you're trying to make love. You have had such a fantastic career. You may view it as a hodgepodge, but it has been extraordinary what you've done thus far with your life and your career, and you are much to be admired. What, what advice would you give to, uh, other than don't do it, to... There's no more room. <laughs> Good luck. To young people, uh, particularly young women, uh, who want to do some of the same things you've done, who want to work in the entertainment business in any format. Is there any guidance you could give them? Well, Stephen, I've always found in my career whenever uh, God shuts a, a window somewhere, he shuts a door too, and then you're screwed. Um, but again, good luck, kids. Uh, I think I, you know, the best advice I've ever gotten, Stephen, is just whatever you do, whatever, you know, whatever you do, do it passionately well. Do whatever you're passionate about. And I think that I really and truly, I joke around, but I, a lot of days on the radio show, I can't believe I get paid for it. I'm in there with two of my best friends just hanging out making fart jokes. What's not great about that? And you know, you feel like if you, if, if it, you know, it also helps change a few hearts and minds, that's great too. But yes. my, my main goal is to make people laugh. And I just think that, um, there is no one path. Look at mine was a complete accident. I didn't go to broadcasting school per se. I mean, a lot of, like we say, that, that, that you know, we make plans and God laughs. I mean, however That's you right. want to say it, um, I think you just have to find out what, what, what you're passionate about. Well, um, but you did have a thought as to what you wanted to do. I can, you, one can trace it from the beginning. It's just that the journey turns out to be so different. Yeah than what you think it's going yeah, to be. Yeah, and sometimes your dreams don't look well like you thought they would. But you know what, sometimes they may turn out to be better in a way you hadn't really, expected to. They really do. Thank you for taking this time. It's so nice to talk to you. Thank you, Stephen.